Well, thank you, uh, Star and Karen, for uh, kicking us off this afternoon. And uh, let me tell you, I'm really happy to see all of my DNA relatives in the room. <laughs> you know, we're all cousins. That's because as humans, we share more than 99.9% .9 of our DNA. But then on the other hand, we also share 99% with our closest relative, the chimpanzee. So you can think about that for a while. Um, if you are curious about your closer human relatives and have chosen to test you in good company, in the last eight years has been exponential growth in the size of data database samples at the four big testing companies, which now exceed 10 million samples. I tested in 2010 and was confronted with a DNA surprise, which as gene genealogists say, shifted my family tree sideways. <laughs> so beware if you test, uh, there may be a surprise out there for you as well. Um, there's a little backstory about why Jennifer is here speaking to you today on DNA testing. Jennifer and I are both graduates of the Boston University Online Certificate Program in Genealogical Research. We had a chance meeting at a genealogical conference in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts last April when we both had recognized we were in the same program together in 2015. The whole thing is virtual, so you never really see anybody. And I think Jennifer was in another section, so. <laughs> but at any rate, we recognized uh, one another from that. And she told me she was uh, specializing in genetic genealogy and had been taking supplemental coursework uh, in that area. In early 2017, I had received a call from a woman who had been adopted and was attempting to find her biological father. She had hired a genealogist to help her find her mother, who was now deceased, but had not any luck in uh, locating her uh, other parent. I recommended that she take a DNA test, which she did, and several months later, um, she called me back stating that she uh, had the results and could I help her understand them? Well, I, I know she needed some expert gene genetic genealogy knowledge so uh, that I could not really provide her at that level, so I gave her Jennifer's email address. And it was not long after that that she emailed, emailed me back saying that Jennifer had helped her find this unknown parent. So uh, today, Jennifer will be uh, talking about interpreting your DNA results and discuss the limits of these tests and what they can and cannot answer. She particularly enjoys genetic genealogy, and I'm quoting her here, because it combines her passions for science, family, and solving mysteries. Her day job is a, as is a research scientist at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth, and she holds a BA degree in anthropology, a master's of science in epidemiology, in addition to her certificate from Boston University, she also has a certificate in genetic genealogy from Excelsior College. Next month, she will join the online program faculty at BU as a facilitator in evidence analysis. She's a member of the National Genealogical Society, Association of Professional Genealogists, the International Society of Genetic Genealogy, New England Historic Genealogical Society in both New Hampshire and Vermont genealogical associations. She's currently wrapping up an 18-month program in a peer-to-peer -peer professional gene genealogy study group, which is called ProGen. Please welcome Jennifer Stone Randolph to Brattleboro. Thank you for that very nice introduction, Jerry, and thank you all for the warm welcome. It's great to be here in Brattleboro, and um, I'm very pleased to see such a great crowd. I really appreciate you all taking time out of your lovely weekend to be here with me today, and I sincerely hope that I'm able to offer each and every one of you something valuable that you can take home with you today and that will have made your time here worthwhile. Um, I want to just go ahead and again, um, first of all, declare I have no conflicts. I don't make money from any of the testing companies. I don't use affiliate links. So that's just sort of standard course to disclose that to everybody. Um, I want to thank the sponsors of this talk, both the Friends of Brooks Memorial Library, as well as Jerry's company, Whetstone Brook Genealogy. I really appreciate them uh, working to get me here today so I can spend some time with you. All right, so the title of the talk today, Making Sense of Your DNA Testing Results, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. And what I mean by that title is we're gonna talk about some of the great benefits, the good, some of the not so great pieces of this, some of the information that may not be ideal, the bad, and then the ugly. And by the ugly, what I really mean is sort of the, the fine print of DNA testing. There are a few things that I think sort of get short shrift 
um, when we see the advertising and when we test. So I wanna talk about those as well, sort of the fine print, things you need to be aware of. And Jerry sort of alluded to one of those things in his introduction. All right, so here's our agenda for the talk today, folks. And I'm not an expert with microphones, so if, if I'm too loud and blowing your ears out or you can't hear me, just somebody signal me, please. I'd appreciate that. All right, so what are we gonna talk about today? We're gonna go over the different types of testing results that these uh, direct-to-consumer kits give you because there are a few different types of results. And some of you have tested have probably already seen that. We're gonna talk about what you can and cannot learn from the results. We're gonna talk about the accuracy of results, each type of results, because they have different levels of accuracy. And this is really important. And I've already talked with someone here today about their frustration with some of their results. Then I wanna walk through a few case studies with you just to give you a sense of how you can leverage your results and maybe start making some progress in your own family history and solve some of your own mysteries. I think sometimes going through a case study and just understanding the logic and the inference involved can be helpful and then you can apply that to your own problems when you get home. Then we're gonna to get to the ugly. Unexpected results and privacy concerns. I think it's really important to at least consider those. I'm not trying to deter anyone from testing, but everyone needs to understand these issues and their own comfort level when they make the choice about testing and how to handle their testing information. And then at the end, I'd love to take uh, questions and provide answers and have discussion as time allows. All right, so let's dig in. All right. Generally speaking, the direct-to-consumer tests, and by those I mean Ancestry.com, 23andMe, MyHeritage, and Family Tree DNA, offer three general types of information. Most of them offer two, but a couple actually do offer a third. So those are the ethnicity estimates. Sometimes you also hear those referred to as admixture or biogeographical estimates as well. Everybody's talking about the same thing, but people have different preferences for what they call it. We've all probably seen those ancestry ads, the guy with the kilt or the lederhosen, and then he takes the test and decides he should have the other one. So where you sort of get your percentage makeup, that's what those are. And then they all give you some sort of relative matching or DNA matching or DNA relatives. They all sort of have their own names, but in essence you get results that are a list of other people who've tested with that company or are in their database who appear to be related to you. You share enough similar DNA that they believe you have a common ancestor somewhere back in your family tree that you share. So you get a list of all those folks. Additionally, they usually give you some range you may have seen, you know, third to fourth cousin, distant cousin, close family. They give you some ballpark idea, and believe me, it's a ballpark how related you might be to that person. And then the third thing that uh, some tests offer is your haplotype. Now your haplotype is a little bit different. This is where, can I use this? Hold, bear with me. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna try this. So when you do, when you get your admixture, your ethnicity estimate and your relative matches, they're looking at all your DNA. So if you can all sort of visualize with me a family tree, where you're at the bottom, and then it's your parents, and then it's your four grandparents, and then your eight great-grandparents, and then your 16 great-great-grandparents. So it's like this big upside-down triangle. These first two tests are looking at your DNA from all those folks, your autosomal DNA. So it's taking into account everybody there to give you those results. When we're talking about haplotypes, we're talking about only a subset of those people. Haplotype results tell you only about your direct maternal or direct paternal line. So what do I mean by that? Imagine that upside down triangle, your direct maternal line is your mother's mother, 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 etc. So you're just getting one line on the outside of that triangle. And then your direct paternal line, same thing, fathers, 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 fathers. So it's very specific just to these two lines. It's not capturing what's going on in the middle. All right, so it gives you information about those lines. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's also really deep ancestry. So instead of focusing on sort of being helpful for the last few hundred years, sort of a, what we call a genealogical time frame, it's really giving you information for thousands of years back. All right, we're looking at early migrations. 
You know, we all came out of Africa, and where did we spread out? So it's really pertaining mostly to that. You can still use it. It's still helpful for modern day problems or genealogical time frame problems. But generally speaking, it's really getting at your deep ancestry. All right, so now let's look at them a little more specifically. So the ethnicity estimation, ancestry ads, the ones that have been very successful selling lots of tests. What are they good for? Entertainment, absolutely. <laughs> They're obviously very successful because as Jerry mentioned, millions and millions of people have seen those ads and decided this looks fun, I'm gonna plunk down my 99 bucks or my 69 bucks if it was on sale or whatever and get this done, all right? So yeah, they're fun, okay? So some people do it just for that. The ethnicity estimation can be useful for people who are adopted because they, may, they know nothing about their ethnic heritage. They have no idea. So they might be interested in doing this to at least have some sense, even if it's not super accurate, but some sense of what their history is. For some people, they're interested in finding out if they have Ashkenazi Jewish heritage. These tests are very good for picking out that particular ethnicity, as well as a few others. We're gonna get into the why of all this in a minute. And then finally, you can often use the information you get from your ethnicity estimate to know how to approach your relative matches. The two can sort of combine um, and be very helpful for helping you understand those. Um, and sorry, one thing I forgot to say, there is a handout which you'll all be getting. It has everything I'm gonna say with even more detail. So it's a pretty beefy handout, but it's gonna be very helpful, I think, um, for you all to understand this. So don't feel like you have to be quickly scribbling everything. It's gonna go, to, go into even more detail than what I am. All right, all right, so that's what ethnicity uh, estimation is useful for. What can it not do? There's some things it definitely cannot do. It does not provide you with a complete an accurate picture of your ethnic heritage at all. It really does not. There's a reason they call it estimates. So it is not doing that. It does not definitively prove relationships. If you and another tester come up with a similar ethnicity estimate, that doesn't necessarily mean you're related. You can't leverage the ethnicity estimate in and of itself to prove a relationship. It can be helpful, but it's not gonna prove the relationship. A lot of us in this country have family stories about having an American Indian or Native American in our family. Um, that's not an uncommon thing. And a lot of people hope that when they take this test, it will sort of lend evidence or lend credence to that family story. It can't necessarily. You can come up with no Native American heritage in your estimate. That does not prove it. that person isn't in your tree. If you come up with a positive result, it's suggestive, but again, it doesn't definitively prove it. And I don't believe that there's any tribe in the United States that will accept DNA evidence of this kind from these tests um, to have tribal affiliation. So that's another thing just to keep in mind. All right? Relative matching. What is that useful for? So remember, this is when you get the list of folks who are also in the database, who have similar DNA to you, and they believe that it's likely you probably shared a common ancestor somewhere back in your family trees. So if this is Joe, and this is Anne, and we build out their trees, at some point they line up with the same person, so they're related, and they have DNA that came from that person, they both have it, they see that commonality, so they think, ah, you two are related. Not sure exactly how, but it looks like at some point you were related. So it's good for that. When you do that, you can expand your family tree. You might get more information. You can connect with people who look like they might be related to you. So it's great for that. Brick walls. My sense is from talking to a lot of you here that there are a lot of people who have been sort of studying their family history. So you may be familiar with this term brick wall. It's kind of a dead end. You've been working on someone in your tree or someone else's tree and you just get stuck. So you're stuck at Joe. You really wanna know who Joe's dad is and there just isn't good documentary evidence for you, be able, for you to be able to resolve that and it's very frustrating. DNA can sometimes circumvent those roadblocks and help you find an answer, all right? So it can be good for that. Once again, if you're an adoptee or birth parent, similarly, if you're donor conceived 
or for some other reason just don't know about your biological family, relative matching is essential for you if you're trying to track down your family. It's amazing what people can do. Even if the best match they have is only a third or fourth cousin, often we can figure out who your biological family is, your parent, or at least a group of siblings who are likely candidates. So very important if that's why you're testing. And finally, testing theories. So going back to our example of Joe, maybe we have a theory as to who Joe's dad is, but again, we don't have great evidence, but we think it might be John, we're pretty sure. Well, DNA testing might enable us to test that theory. If we know who John's relatives are, and then you're matching with people on that tree, that could be an indication that you're related, that that theory that John is Joe's dad is true, all right? What can it not do? Some people actually go into testing with the misconception that when they get their results back from the testing company, they're gonna be given sort of a pre-made family tree, a populated family tree with all your relatives. It's not that easy. It requires some light work and some detective work. I think it's fun and worth it and fascinating, but you will not get back a populated family tree. You will get back a nice list of people that you're likely related to, but you have to figure out where they fit in on your tree. Um, it's not gonna tell you, again, we've touched on this, it's not gonna give you the precise relationship for every match. It's gonna give you a ballpark figure. All right, and we're gonna dig much deeper into this and how you can sort this out. But you need to think, what are the ages of the people involved? Where were they living? Things like that to truly figure out how a relationship is. You cannot go by the estimate the company provides you. The other thing relative matching does not do is it does not match you to all testers that you share a genealogical link with. And this is important to understand. So we probably all have a general idea of how DNA inheritance works. We get half of our DNA from our, our parents, half from mom, half from dad, and they in turn got half from each of their parents. But we didn't get exactly 25% from each of our grandparents. We got exactly 50% from our parents, but you know, roughly on average 25% from our grandparents, but there's a little bit of wiggle room. Maybe we got 27% from one grandparent, 23% from another, that kind of thing. So if you carry that idea back farther and farther, what you realize is that people's DNA contributions, these are your ancestors, these are your relatives, these are your genealogical relatives, but their DNA contribution to you many generations later might have dropped off. They're still your relative, but you don't necessarily still carry their DNA. So if you don't still carry their DNA, you're not gonna match to someone else who's related to them because that information has dropped off and is lost. So if that triangle is your genealogical tree, your DNA tree is only a subset of that because you don't hold on to everybody's DNA, all right? It's sort of some are rolling off through the generations, all right? So it's not a complete picture of who you are and for that reason, you won't necessarily always match to someone you're related with. And this is really true for, you know, fourth, fifth cousin, so getting back there, right? All right, the haplotype. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about this. This is sort of the last piece I wanna do to cover for this. If you test with uh, 23andMe, you do get your haplotypes. For the other uh, companies, you don't, Family Tree DNA, you can pay extra to get this, but it's really a different kind of test. Um, the maternal line is tested through something called mitochondrial DNA. We have a little bit of DNA in our mitochondria, and it is from our mom. So the DNA that we all carry in our mitochondria is from our mom, and she got it from her mom, got it from her mom, got it from her mom, all right? And so that's how you get your maternal line haplotype. That's how that is tested. Y DNA comes from the Y chromosome. So ladies, what does that mean? We are out of luck. You cannot test me or any other biological female in here for their paternal direct line because we don't have a Y chromosome. You still have a direct paternal line. You just need to find someone who's biological male to do that test for you. 
So your father, a full brother, if your father has a brother, uh, that kind of thing, someone else on that direct maternal line. So how can this be used? Well, you might be interested in knowing about your haplotype to sort of assess whether or not someone, a relative that you think fits on your direct maternal or direct maternal line, you might want to do this test so you can see. This is a way of sorting, sort of ruling them in or out if they're on those direct lines. And if you want to learn about that really deep ancestry. I saw some of the advertising for this talk was sort of on a map of, of the world and you saw sort of this tree coming out of Africa and spreading. That's deep ancestry. That's human migration. And this is what this can tell you about. We're talking, again, going back thousands of years, where were your people? So it can be interesting to use. Um, but in that context, it's really more about your deep ancestry and not, not your more recent ancestry. All right, so let's talk about accuracy, because this is where the fun really starts. Oh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. So the haplotype, as I've already discussed, it's not gonna tell you anything about those people other than your direct lines, all those people in the middle of your tree. And because it mutates very slowly, and it's good for this deep ancestry, but it just, it changes very slowly. So even if you do match someone, you don't know if you're related to them in the last, you know, could be four or five generations or one generation, because it just, it's, it's a kind of DNA that mutates very, very slowly. It's not like autosomal DNA. So again, it's not good for figuring out the timing of relatedness, sort of how closely you're related. It has some benefits, but limited, okay? All right. Sorry for the jumping ahead. All right, ethnicity estimates, accuracy. And I know my new friend Grace is <laughs> dying to hear about this because we were talking about it. Your ethnicity estimates are only that, estimates, exclamation point, underline, bold, everything. Do not be surprised if you take this test and your heritage comes back completely different than what you expected and what you know to be true from your research, that is very common, and, and we're gonna get into the reason why. Generally speaking, this is the least accurate piece of information you can get from these DNA tests. It's probably also what sells the most tests, which is a little bit ironic. <laughs> a lot of people buy their tests because they wanna know exactly this, and then they're a little upset and frustrated when it tells them something that's very different than what they expected to see. So you really need to take this with a big grain of salt. And I'm hoping that part of what I can do with the presentation today is get you excited about relative matching, which is very powerful and much more accurate and what you can do with that. Because this is fun and entertaining, but it's not that accurate. All right, why? Why doesn't this work so well? All right, so how do they do it? How do they come up with these ethnicity estimates? So they have your sample and they have your DNA, and then they have these what we call reference panels. So for each ethnic group that they're, and, and everyone groups ethnicity is a different way, they come up with sort of a panel of, of sort of like, this is what classic, let's say Irish, Irish DNA looks like. So we're gonna go to Ireland, find someone who's Irish and say, are both your parents Irish? Yep. How about your grandparents? Are all four of your grandparents Irish? Yep. Okay, great, you qualify as really, really, really Irish. And we're gonna find a bunch of you who are really, really, really Irish. We're gonna ask you to give us your DNA, and we're gonna say, this is what really, really Irish DNA looks like. And we're gonna do this for all sorts of ethnic groups. Now in Europe, it's pretty easy, and we have quite a few people who ponied up their DNA. In different parts of Africa, different parts of Asia, not so much. The numbers of people, on these reference panels vary widely. Again, your European reference panels are much more robust. They have more people. That doesn't mean they are not problematic, but they do have a larger sample, which is important from a statistical standpoint. All right. Now, the other thing to note is that every company has their own reference panels. Ancestry's reference panels, different from my heritage, different from 23andMe, different from family tree DNA. There are some sort of studies, some public, publicly available studies of, of DNA across ethnicities that they all might have drawn in, but they have all added in their own panels as well, all right? So that's how they do it. Then they look at you and they say, okay, 
here's Jennifer, and you know, here's this kind of DNA. How do, how do we compare? Does she have stretches that seem to fit there, or stretches that seem to fit there? And oh look, she has a stretch here that usually it's Irish, but sometimes it's Portuguese. So we're gonna say, odds are it's Irish, so we're gonna call it Irish for her. And maybe I'm the unusual Portuguese person, so that's, that's how that works, all right? So they have these reference panels, and they have these algorithms. Again, they all have their own way of doing this that they use for these. So what's the problem with that? Well, is there really pure Irish DNA? Let, let me ask you this. Has anyone here tested their dog's DNA like me? <laughs> all right, I see a couple hands going up. Okay, might this work a little bit better with dogs? So how do they do it with dogs? Well. AKC registered Great Pyrenees, whose parents were definitely AKC registered Great Pyrenees, and it goes back a bazillion years, and you better believe they didn't let that very expensive AKC registered Pyrenees mate with anybody else, right? So with dogs, it's actually a little bit easier to get pure, you know, breed DNA. People, we're not dogs. We don't work that way at all. We have had all sorts of migrations and conquests and relationships that people don't know happened, and all sorts of reasons. So it's really, really hard to say that we have, this is what Irish DNA looks like, this is what Italian DNA looks like. Is everyone with me? Can we see sort of the problems with just this basic premise? In general, and this is very disappointing, I know, because you can kind of look in the mirror and figure this out, these estimates are good at the continent level. Your European, if you just look at the European without into those, you know, finer cut categories, that's probably pretty accurate. Asian, that's probably pretty accurate. African, that's probably pretty accurate. But again, you probably already knew that. But once you get into these other categories where they're really trying to parse out more like country level, it's not very good, right? With a few exceptions, when there's an asterisk, that's my reminder. <laughs> it's for me. There are a few exceptions. There are some populations that have been very insular, meaning they, they have really stuck together, they have really married and born children within that group without much influence from the outside. And so that has given their DNA the time to mutate over time and become very distinct. They have a very unique DNA signature that there's no mixing it up with other kinds of DNA. Probably the two of the best examples of that are the Ashkenazi Jewish DNA and Finnish DNA also. And some native DNA would also fall in that category. So again, think of populations that historically have been isolated geographically or for cultural reasons, and they might have a very distinct DNA signature that's easily distinguishable from everybody else. But they're the exception, okay? All right. This we sort of already talked about, but your DNA that you carry is only a portion of your relatives. So remember how we talked about you only inherit 50% from mom and 50% from dad? So what if mom had one Italian grandparent? Maybe you didn't get much of mom's Italian DNA. You got, you got her, her Finnish grandparent. So that Italian may not show up in your estimate. So there's another reason why these might seem inaccurate because you don't carry everybody's DNA. You lost half of each of your parents' DNA. So that's a lot of your heritage right there that's not gonna be picked up on by this test. The other thing, ethnicity. Is ethnicity really a biological construct? It's really more of a cultural construct. It's, you know, so, so we're using a biological test to try and capture what you know, heritage, your ethnicity, which is really, which really in many ways is more of a, a, a cultural construct. So it falls short there too. So hopefully I'm making the case and you're all seeing that there are some drawbacks here. All right, I like to look at examples. I think it's fun. So, full siblings, Mike and Nancy. And think about this. If they're full siblings, they're not identical twins, but they're full siblings. Same mom and dad, right? Same grandparents. Same great-grandparents, oh, everybody. They have identical family trees. They have exactly the same ancestors. And by the way, all these examples I'm gonna show you today, these are true people, these are clients who have tested. I've changed their names and I changed some details for privacy reasons, but these are all 
True stories, okay? All right, so what do we see with Mike and Nancy? Let's look. Oh, look at Mike. 57% Great Britain. Wow, that means mom or dad just, just came from London practically, right? That's a lot. Well, Nancy, well, look at her. I can't see from this angle. 13%? Well, that's funny, isn't it? Exactly the same relatives, but look how different those estimates are. All right, and then, look, Nancy's got, whoa, 40%. You're at West, that's a lot. How about, uh, how about her brother Mike? <gasps> nothing, nothing at all. Siblings with exactly the same ancestry, very different estimates, all right? Now why? Part of it because those reference panels aren't that good, and part of it because even though they had the same parents, they inherited different DNA from each parent. And you can see that can make a huge difference, right? All right, let's check out another one. All right, now we have Erica and Lucas, again, full siblings, both do their test. Let's see, let's see how Ancestry did on this, these two. All right, well, I see Erica, her lowest category is Great Britain at 8%, and Lucas, that's his highest category at 21%. Again, full siblings, exactly the same relatives, but look how different. All right, let's look at what was Erica's top category. Scandinavia, 18%. And Lucas comes in with 7%. Very different, exact same set of relatives. Now, what is kind of the same here? Look at this, they both got Native American. Erica's 17%, Lucas, and I'm sorry, I can't really read from this angle, I think that's 18%. Not only are they calling it Native American, they're calling it Nicaragua and Costa Rican, so a very specific piece. Um, and this is totally accurate. One of their parents, their father, is Costa Rican. So that's accurate, and maybe that is just unique enough that it was easy to pick out. Because if you look at the history of Nicaragua and Costa Rica, they didn't have the gold, they didn't have all the manpower, it wasn't like Mexico and some of the other countries in Central America. They were relatively isolated. So once the Spaniards got there, they were just kinda, there weren't that many of them, and they were just kinda doing their own thing and marrying with each other and relatively isolated. So they probably have a pretty unique DNA signature. So it's no surprise that did get picked up and is pretty similar across siblings. Okay, so that's interesting. What about company to company? How similar do you think our results are that way? All right, so our friend Nancy, she's back. And she's a real, um, she's a real diehard. She, she tested with all four companies, because she's really into this. <laughs> okay, so she tests with Ancestry, and this is what she gets. As, as you might remember, that Europe West, 40%, and just a little bit of Great Britain. Um, what I want you to focus on is the Scandinavia. Look at that, 21% Scandinavia. That's almost like having one grandparent, right? That's Scandinavian, because that's roughly 25%. So that's a pretty good chunk of Scandinavian. All right, so then she looks at, I have to remember what these are, this is family tree DNA. Hmm, wow, 76% British Isles. That's, that's different, and Scandinavia, is that in there? Oh yeah, 5%. Well, that's pretty different than 21%. All right, let's see what 23andMe has to say. All right, so there's the 23andMe breakdown. And Scandinavia, three, that's 3.03%. .03%. So we got three, five, and 21%. And then let's see, this is my heritage, and my heritage is gonna say, I think 6.2%. Three, five, 6.2, and uh, looks like my ancestry is sort of the outlier with 21%. The point I'm making is that these aren't that accurate. And if you didn't like what you got at my heritage, try ancestry. <laughs> Maybe that'll be more what, what you're looking for. Um, we can do one more. Um, this is Eleven, another young lady who tested, and she um, wasn't quite as diehard. She only tested at three companies, but let's see how she came out. All right, so there's 23 and me, and she was really interested in finding out about her Italian ancestry, and she was very disappointed, 13.7%, because she's pretty sure she's half Italian. <laughs> All right, and then um, this is my heritage. And they 48.3%. My heritage seems to be more on the money for this one. 
And then finally she tested with Ancestry, and they don't really have an Italian per se category, but she got sort of Southern European 19%. All right, so you guys get my point. Grain of salt, grain of salt. These are not good estimates. So don't be disappointed, don't be upset, don't wonder what the heck if it's not what you think it is and what you know to be true from your own documentary research, okay? It's just not a great uh, test for accuracy. All right, relative matching. I feel like relative matching is sort of the ugly stepsister of DNA results and it really shouldn't be because this is where the power is. This is where you can do some really fun stuff and make some great discoveries. This is generally accurate. If someone is called as a relative, usually they are. Now I have an asterisk to remind me to give you a little more. It is possible, as we've already said, to be related to someone and it doesn't get picked up because you don't still carry the DNA. And there are things such as false positives where they, they say, oh yeah, I think you are related, but maybe you're not. And, and I have a silly analogy I kind of use for people. If you show up at work one day and you and a coworker are wearing the same socks, but everything else is different. Like that happens, right? That's chance. You both happen to choose, decide to wear the same socks that day. So just by chance, you might be a little bit the same, all right? If you show up at work and you're wearing everything the same, the same earrings, the same necklace, the same blouse, probably you talked about it. Or one of you really likes the way the other one of you dressed. That probably wasn't just chance. And that's kind of what goes on here. If you have a really distant match that they're calling with kind of a, a small piece of DNA, it's entirely possible that by chance, you happen to have the same little sequence of DNA, not that you're related. Right? But just think of all the DNA you have and that by chance a small little run might be the same as someone else, just by chance, not because you have a common relative, that can happen. This really isn't an issue until beyond, I'd say, fifth cousins. I generally don't use fifth cousin matches anyway, but so it is possible they might say someone's a relative and they aren't. But generally speaking, it's really accurate. They aren't comparing you to some you know, panel that they came up with. They're taking Grace's DNA, and my DNA, and putting it side by side and comparing it. So they're pretty good at finding those like areas, okay? So it is accurate. What's tricky, though, is finding out how precisely you are related, all right? Because as I, as I mentioned, they're gonna give you a ballpark estimate, but you can't really go by that. You should put as much stock in that as you do in your ethnicity estimate. All right, so you have to do a little legwork here, but it's fun and it's worth it, all right? All right, so it's your DNA compared directly to other testers, as I said. It's not that they're coming up with some reference panel and trying to figure you out that way. The amount you share suggests what relationships you might have. So if you have 50% with someone, what are we thinking? That's probably one of your parents or an identical twin of one of your parents. There are always these weird cases you have to be careful of. Um, but if you just have a, a smidge, then, oh my gosh, it could be you know, a third cousin twice removed. It could be a half great great uncle. Like suddenly it gets more complicated and, and you have to start reasoning it to try and figure out what's the most likely way that we're related. Close relationships are easy to call because it's just so much DNA. It's easy to say, all right, well, that's a grandparent. That's a parent. That's easy. It's these more distant uh, relationships that these company estimates become less reliable and you have to do a little bit of legwork. But it's not hard and I'm gonna show you how to do it. So the more distantly related you are, the more possibility for variation in how much shared DNA you have. And I think we sort of talked about this. Parents are 50%, grandparents are roughly 25%. Sorry, I talk a lot with my hands. So they're roughly 25%, but there's a little wiggle room. So then when you go to great-grandparents, roughly 12.5%, but now there's even more wiggle room. And as you go back, the wiggle room around those estimates gets to be bigger and bigger. So what happens? You start getting overlapping categories of relationship. So if you have a certain amount of DNA, it fits into more than one relationship. So that's when things can get a little bit tricky. And that's exactly what I'm talking about there. And we're gonna run through an example which I think will clarify this. 
And then things can get really confusing when you have half relationships. So maybe half brothers have kids, those are half cousins, they have kids, those are half second cousins, or half cousins once removed, so that starts getting complicated. Double relationships, two sisters marry two brothers. They all have kids, those are double cousins. They're gonna have twice first the amount of DNA you would expect first cousins to have because they're first cousins through their moms and their dad, right? Like, so it's just, everything gets doubled, so that can be confusing. Endogamy. Endogamy is a term, remember we were talking about the Ashkenazi Jewish population? If you have a population that has consistently been pretty insular and only been marrying and having children uh, within that population, so think Ashkenazi Jewish, think French Canadian, that can be hard. Think early colonial Americans. They're often just a small group of people. Think Costa Ricans, like we saw in the example. Um, so they're often just sort of marrying and marrying and marrying, and cousins are marrying. Not necessarily first cousins, but second cousins marrying, third cousins marrying. So you have all this kind of extra DNA because suddenly you're related, to, you might be related to multiple people, right? And you're getting a little bit of DNA from all of them because there's been all this sort of intermarrying going on. So that can be a little challenging because you might match to someone that says, hey, Hey, French Canadian person, look, here's another French Canadian person who's your fourth cousin. Probably, actually, they're more distant than that, but because of endogamy and a French Canadian population, it looks like the amount of DNA you'd expect for a fourth cousin, but it's really because there are a few contributions there. So you really might be more like a sixth cousin. That's a real headache. Sorry. <laughs> um, and then pedigree collapse. Pedigree collapse is similar to this idea of endogamy. It's when if you're looking at your inverted triangle, the problem is great grandma is great grandma, but she's also a great great aunt too. So some of what would be sort of the, the positions in your tree are sort of collapsing because you have one person who's fulfilling multiple, multiple places. Again, this can mess up our DNA numbers. So if you're working with a population that has this history, you need to be mindful of it and sort of adjust a little. So they can be a little bit challenging to work with. All right, I want to give you an example of why you should not listen to what the testing companies tell you. So this is a match for a client of mine on um, Ancestry. And this was great, this was exciting. This was a really big match. Uh, so it was very exciting. And they were predicting that this match was a uh, first cousin is what Andrew was saying. We're pretty sure this is a first cousin to you, and when I clicked on the little I, which is a trick you all need to know, it gives me the exact amount of DNA. You share 816 centimorgans. Centimorgans is the unit of measure. I conceive of it sort of as, as length, it's not, but that's an easy way to think about it, all right? So you have altogether an 816 stretch of common DNA with this person, okay? If you had a thousand, you'd be even more closely related, all right? So it's just an easy way to think about it. All right, so she's really excited. She has all this DNA that she shares with this gentleman. But here's the problem. My client's 22, and the match is 72. What do you think? First cousins? I'm guessing that's, that's a long shot, and that they probably would know if they were first cousins, because they both knew uh, fair amount about their family. The thing is, with that same amount of shared DNA, this gentleman could also be a great uncle or a half uncle, because they would be expected to share that amount of DNA too. Multiple relationships. Ancestry is just gonna look at the number and say, oh, we think it's this. You have to put on your detective caps and say, does that make sense? No. What other relationships share this amount of DNA? We did more research, the gentleman is my client's great uncle, right? Okay, so now we're gonna do some case studies. Before we do that, I wanna tell you what the essential tools are for you to go home and do this kind of thing on your own, right? There's some really some must-haves for you to delve into the power of your relative matches. The first is a DNA relationship chart, and I'm gonna show you all these. The next is familiarity with the website. So, whether you tested with Ancestry or MyHeritage, get to know all the features. Just say, 
All right, this afternoon I'm just gonna spend a few hours getting to know my website, all right? Really important because you wanna be able to leverage all the tools they give you. You need a question. You don't just wanna go at this willy-nilly because you're gonna get frustrated and bored and never do it again. You need to think about your family. What are you curious about? What do you have questions about? You need your family tree or some sort of, some way to represent relationships because you're gonna be have, to, have to be thinking about where people are generally, generationally relative to each other, where you are, where match fits in. So you need some way of doing that, all right? And you need some way to get evidence besides DNA. It's a great tool, but it's not gonna just give you the answers. So you need another place to go to look at census information, vital records, that kind of thing. All right, so let's start with the relationship chart. This relationship chart, courtesy of Blaine Bettinger, is in your handout. So I've given you one already, so you have no excuse. <laughs> Made it easy, you, you, can, you can use this one. There are many out there. At the end of your handout there um, is a listing of resources, and I've told you about some of the others, but you can also just Google DNA relation chart and pick one that you like. Some of them have pretty colors, this one does. This chart, the way it works, is it lists all sorts of relationships. Great grandparent, grandparent, parent, sibling, niece, nephew, great niece, nephew, half third cousin, half second cousin, all sorts of relationships. And then Blaine has made this very clear with a nice little key up here. It gives you the average DNA that you would expect to find. So if you're testing and your parent tested, you would expect to see this many centimorgans, our good friend the centimorgan is back, um, of, sorry, of DNA. And then he gives you a range, because of course there is a range, this is just an average. This chart is based on um, people's actual contributions, so in other words, people who tested their parents um, sent the data to, to Blaine. I know these were my parents, they tested and here's how much DNA we shared. So that's how he came up with these numbers. So this is a great resource and it's based on real data, all right? So this can work two ways. You can, if you have a match, you can look and find the number that is closest to what you share with that match and see what, what relationships might work. Or if you're curious, all right, if I'm trying to identify a grandparent, how much DNA, DNA am I looking for? And you can look up the number there. So it's pretty intuitive. And again, this is in your packet. So you need this tool to analyze your matches. All right, familiarity with the testing website. Why is this important? First of all, you need to be able to know where to find your centimorgans. They don't always make it easy. Ancestry, you gotta click on your match and then you gotta click on the little, I think a little circle with a question mark and a box will pop up and tell you. Every one of these is different. They're always retooling their websites, so you might have to dig around. They often have great tutorials and things like that sort of built into the website. Read them, take advantage, learn how to use these tools. They're your friends. You wanna know if there are any ways you can sort your matches. Sometimes people have provided surname information, so you wanna be able to sort by surname. Maybe there's a surname you know that's in your family and you wanna find all the matches who share that surname somewhere in their tree. Again. Figure out what your options are in the website. Spend some time. Can you mark matches? A lot of them have a little uh, feature where you can turn on or off a star. Very important. Say I'm interested in finding out about my dad's side of the family. I want to be able to mark everyone who appears to be on the paternal side or who appears to be on the maternal side. I want to mark them so that I can distinguish. I don't want to waste my time researching my dad's family looking at my mom's matches. That would be a colossal waste of time. So when you have these tools, learn how to use them, all right? Um, some have a little notes field. You can actually type in a little note. So if you've learned something about a given match, you have a place to put your notes, and they're safe and secure and attached to your match. Can you download the match DNA? I'm guessing some of you in here are spreadsheet people and working on becoming a spreadsheet person, but some of these places will actually let you download all this information you can put it into an Excel spreadsheet, and then you can really go crazy with the sorting feature. So find out. Find out if your testing company offers that. Define focus, hypotheses, or questions. To be able to organize your strategy and attack this problem and solve it, you've got to know what the problem is, all right? 
You want to be able to develop your strategy to solve a given question. So you've got to have a question. Sometimes you may have a big question, and as you think it through, you realize, to answer my big question, I'm going to have to break this down into smaller steps and answer a few other questions along the way to get there. And that's fine. But just have a direction. Have a curiosity. Where are you going? Because you're not going to be able to come up with your attack plan if you don't have that. I actually write down my, my questions and my strategy for solving them. That way if I have to put things down and go make dinner and help a kid with homework and then it's bedtime and then I come back, okay, this is where I was. Actually, it's more like you know two weeks usually that you have to put something down. <laughs> but, but document, document, document. Short-term pain but long-term gain. Highly recommend it. Learned the hard way. All right, this idea of having a family tree. You're going to want to be able to visualize your matches, so this is important. Um, if you're working on a complex problem, you're going to be adding, deleting, and moving your matches all over the place, trying to see how they can possibly all fit in your tree with those amounts of DNA, and it all makes sense. It's like a puzzle. You know, if Susan's got this many centimorgans related to me, and Anne has this many, you know, and she goes here, could Susan go here? No, that doesn't work. How about this and this? You're going to be doing some of that. So have some mechanism for doing this. There are software programs out there you can use. You can just draw it. I use sticky notes, you know, a name, the amount of centimorgans, and then you, know, you can just kind of be pasting them all over the place and moving, moving them as you need. Um, also, same idea before in terms of documenting your question. If you have any known facts, kind of have them listed out and at hand. Um, or if there's certain criteria you, you know have to be true about the person you're trying to find. Have it written out and have it right there. Easy reference. So when I'm trying to figure out someone's parent who is adopted, we often have what's called non-identifying information, which are things like Irish, 32, you know, was married, um, had one daughter, information like that. I want that at hand, so if I'm looking at a census entry for someone who might be the person we're trying to look. Well, are they the right age? You know, do they have one kid? Do they live in the right place? That kind of thing. So if you have that information at hand, that's useful. Again, keep it, keep it simple, keep it organized. It's a little painful in the beginning, but it does help you in the long term. All right, you need a place to look at those things like vital record, records, census schedules. So you want some sort of uh, resource for your documentary evidence. Um, Almost always you're going to rely on this in addition to your DNA evidence. It's, it's very rare where you can just use your DNA evidence to solve something. But, you know, if, if you're adopted and you're tested, someone comes up as your parent, well, that does happen. So um, sometimes you don't need this documentary evidence, but almost always you do. So you want to have a way to get that. There are lots of uh, websites that have great resources. FamilySearch.org is free, so you don't have to spend money. And I know Jerry was telling me, I think he's given a talk on how to make good use of this website. So, you know, people generally are. There are um, other um, subscription sites. But again, you don't have to pay money. You could go with Family Search. Find out, are there items your family has? Does someone have a family Bible with interesting information? Passports, um, vital records. You might have some resources just even right within your family that are helpful. And don't forget libraries archives and repositories also can have information can help, that can help you. So yes, you need some legwork. DNA doesn't hand it to you on a, a silver platter. You have to do a little work too. But honestly, this is kind of where the fun comes in, especially if you like solving mysteries. All right, let's go through some case studies. How am I doing on time? Thank you. <laughs> All right, we're going to start with just a really straightforward simple one. All right, case study one. So here's someone who tested Ted. And he gets his results. He didn't really have a plan. He just kind of tested. Um, but once he saw his results, he was curious about them. So he did the family finder test at Family Tree DNA. And his first match was his daughter. Well, that was a no-brainer. He knew that. But then he had the second match, which was kind of interesting, Cordelia. And with Cordelia, he had a match of 229 centimorgans. That's almost the first thing you want to do when you're assessing a match, is understand how much you share in common with them, all right? So 
He looked at that, 229 centimorgans, well that's a good match, and she was his second best match, so that was interesting. This name Cordelia was interesting, because Ted remembered hearing that name somewhere in his family, like, you know, way, 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 way back. Maybe there was some artifact the family had that had an inscription of Cordelia. So this really piqued his interest. Um, unfortunately, since he had taken the time to learn about Family Tree DNA's website, he knew that this grayed out little family tree symbol down here meant Cordelia had not offered any family tree information. Well, that's too bad, that would have been helpful. He did know also though that she had taken the time to put in some of her surnames um, that were in her family and locations, but none of those rang a bell at all for Ted. So this was kind of a mystery. How is he related to Cordelia? All right, first thing, let's look up that centimorgan number. That was 229, right? All right, so what are the possibilities on here? I recommend starting with looking at the average. Once you get into the range, it gets ugly real fast. So start with the low-hanging fruit. If it doesn't work out, then you're gonna have to get more into the weeds and look at every relationship that it possibly could be. But let's start with our most likely candidates. All right, half first cousin once removed. That's a mouthful. 226 centimorgans. That's a good candidate. What else? First cousin twice removed. Does everyone understand about the removed? So first cousins are the same generation. I had to use my hands again. All right, siblings have kids. Those kids to each other are first cousins. Everybody knows that, right? If those first cousins have kids, those are second cousins to each other, all right? Now I'm gonna go back up to one of the first cousins. This first cousin to this kid, so she has her first cousin who has a kid. This, these are first cousins once removed because they're off by one generation, all right? Now if this one has a kid, boop, way down here, this person to this person is first cousins twice removed. Two generations, okay? Pictures, draw a picture. That's why we draw a picture, because it's hard to keep this in our head. Okay, so here we have first cousin twice removed is in the range. And then we have up here, second cousin is also in the range. Okay, so I forget the fake name I was using. Was it Ted? Yeah, I think we'll say it was Ted. Okay, so Ted, Ted's like, I looked at that picture of Cordelia. She doesn't look that different in age than me. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say I think, I think that we would be separated by two generations is unlikely. And I don't know of any remarriages in my family tree. So I'm gonna say this is probably unlikely. And I think this is probably the most likely, but I'm just not sure. Well, again, because Ted, it is Ted, right? Yes. Ted has taken the time to make sure he knows the website. He's like, aha, blue envelope on Family Tree DNA means they have an email. I can get in touch with them and ask them questions. So indeed, Ted emails Cordelia, and they compare notes, and it turns out that, what do you know, they are second cousins. So here's Ted, and here's Cordelia, and Cordelia's dad and Ted's dad then Ted's grandpa and Cordelia's grandma were siblings. They were both children of Irving Sr. and Cordelia. So Ted kind of remembered that name, and that's because his great-grandmother was Cordelia. And Cordelia's great-grandmother was Cordelia. So they were able to find each other through this match, share family stories, and fill in their trees a little more. Very basic example very straightforward, within reach of all of you. You could probably all go home and do this tonight. <laughs> yes, you could, don't laugh. Because <laughs> you have the chart, it's in your handout. You could totally do it. <laughs> all right, let's go through another case study. Um, DNA evidence to address inaccurate records. So this is a very interesting case. And this is gonna sort of, everything I poo-pooed to you about ethnicity estimates that you're gonna be like, well, now you're saying it's a good thing. But anyway, let's look at this. Dustin is an African-American gentleman who believes that one of his grandfathers, his maternal grandfather, may actually have been a white gentleman, and not the African-American man who was named on his mother's birth certificate. And this is family lore. There's a lot of kind of whispers 
And indeed, his mom was like super fair compared to the rest of the family. Um, his mom had passed. Um, he was very young when she died of cancer and his grandma was gone. And most of his family was gone. And he was just really curious and he wanted to know if there was anything to this. He just, just kind of had a nagging question about it. So he, um, I worked with him and we decided to turn to DNA testing to see if we could help him determine if this was the case, if there was any truth to this rumor. This wasn't necessarily going to be easy, mind you, because most African Americans in this country who have been here since slavery are going to have European DNA, right? Like that's just a sad fact of how slavery works. So I wasn't sure what we were going to find here, but we decided to go ahead and try. And um, Dustin tested with all four companies. When I'm working with unknown parents or unknown grandparents, I usually recommend that because then you're getting information from every single database. If you can afford it, it's a good option. Okay, so we test at Ancestry and check that out. 26% European Jewish, 18% Congo, 18% the Nian Togo, we have Ivory Coast in Ghana and Senegal. Well, that's kind of interesting. Let's see what we get from Family Tree DNA. Ah, oh, 26% Jewish. That's interesting. Let's see what we get from my heritage. I don't know how well you can see it, but Ashkenazi Jewish, 27%. All right, let's see what we got at the last place. Um, this is 23 in me, and they just have this very broad European category, but you can break it out into finer categories, and we see, I'm sorry to stand in front, um, I think that's 27 as well. So what do we see here? 26, 26, 27, 27. How much DNA do you get from a grandparent? About 25%. Now, this doesn't definitively prove but it certainly is suggestive. When we dug into the records some more, I found that application of his grandma um, for a social security number um, and her employer, um, she worked as a, a housekeeper and her employer was a Jewish family. So we think that we probably can say with reasonable certainty um, to Ted that, um, or no, this isn't Ted anymore, Dustin that, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, yes, it, it looks like the family rumblings were, were likely true and it probably was an unfortunate situation. Um, we haven't been able to identify, I'm not sure it's the same family because the, the social security document was a few years um, before my client's uh, mother was born, so who knows if she was with the same family or not. But um, we don't, the other thing I will say is when we look at um, matches, they, they fall very neatly into two categories. There's lots of people who are African American, and, and when you look at your matches, you see their ethnicity, little categories, their description. So it's like African American, African American, you know, all these different African countries. And then he has this other set of matches, and they're all 100% Jewish. So again, this, is, this lends credence to the idea that this was a relatively recent event, and one person contributing all this DNA, as opposed to small, smaller contributions from multiple people. All right, so after I told you how useless um, the ethnicity estimates are, sometimes they are helpful, and this is, an, this is a case where they were. We have not been able to use his um, Jewish matches because they're all fourth cousin or um, farther, which really means they're probably more like fifth or sixth cousin or farther, so we haven't been able to give him more than that, but at least a partial answer to his question. Okay, one more case study, um, confirming relatedness. All right. Billy is unsure of the identity of his grandmother, Susan's mother, so his great-grandmother, right? Because he can't find a birth certificate. This is a very common story. You get into certain states, like New York, it's a black hole, or you get into certain time periods. It's not like New England. We're really spoiled to live in New England. There just aren't always a lot of vital records, and you don't necessarily find a birth certificate or a baptismal certificate. <coughs> Susan, this is what my client knew, Susan had always lived with her acknowledged father, Jonathan, but not with Jonathan's wife. It was kind of strange. Jonathan and Karen were married, they had one daughter, and then boom, Karen's off living with that older daughter, and then they had this, we think, much younger daughter, 
Um, but she was always Susan, but Susan was always living with Jonathan. She never lived with Karen. That just seemed a little funny. Um, and the older daughter was Maxine. Um, so it just seemed a little funny that Susan never lived with Karen if Karen was her mom. And there were some rumblings in this family too. You know, like snide comments. You know, oh, your sister, half sister, you know. That kind of made my client wonder what was really going on here. So we decided, well, can we figure this out with DNA? So what's our question? and go through the process I told you you should do. Were Susan and Maxine full sisters? Or are they only half sisters? That's our question. So we're gonna have Billy, my client, test with Ancestry, and then our plan, so he's, he is, uh, oh, did I just mess this up? No, okay, so he, I did sort of, okay. So we know that Billy is a living descendant um, of Susan, so we're gonna try and figure out who might be a living descendant of Maxine and compare their DNA to Billy's. All right, because that's going to help us answer the question. They'll either be, you know, whatever level of cousin at the full amount or the half amount, and that should answer our question. So this makes us realize that we have an intermediate question we have to deal with: who are the living descendants of Maxine? Right, because we need to find someone to test. All right, so we do some um, paper exploring, and we find um, someone who's at the right place on the tree and who is willing to test. So here's Billy. And Billy's mom was Claudia, and then we have Susan. Susan is our question mark, all right? We're not sure if Susan is really a child of Jonathan and Karen, or just Jonathan. That's the question. We know Maxine is a daughter of both of them. So we have found Maxine's granddaughter and Susan's grandson, and we get them both to test. And we're trying to find out, so let's do our little exercise. Mom and dad, siblings, these are first cousins, second cousins. Right? Everybody with me? So our question becomes, are they full second cousins or only half second cousins? All right, well, did I use my circles? I did. If they're full second cousins according to our chart, we want them to share 233 <coughs> centimorgans of DNA. All right, that's why you gotta have your chart. All right, if they're half second cousins, they're only gonna have half that, which is about 117 centimorgans. All right, so we know what we're looking for. All right, those are those numbers because I can't retain things for more than one slide. And Billy and Joyce share 262 centimorgans of DNA. So what's the conclusion? What do you think? They're probably full siblings, right? Because this is much closer to the amount of DNA you expect full second cousins to share than half. So Karen is likely Susan's mom, um, and we're not sure what the fam family dynamics were that everyone was kind of living in different places. Maybe it was just financial. I mean, we don't know. We don't know, but we have this question mark. Now, just to be devil's advocate, if we go back to our chart, do notice the range is 9 to 397 for half-second cousin. So, you know, it's still possible, but we did locate some documentary evidence, that's why you gotta use that too, that showed us, um, it was the social security number application that I'm talking about, does a lot today, aren't it? Um, for both Susan and Maxine, and they, they listed Jonathan and Karen as their parents, they both did, so I'm inclined to believe that um, Susan really was a, a full sibling to Maxine, all right? But here's a case where we had to actually go out and find someone to test for us. And sometimes you have to do that depending on your question, but you gotta know what your question is and you gotta have your plan of attack. So that's sort of what I'm wanting you to take home from that. All right, so now I have to get back up to speed, sorry. Okay, now we're gonna talk about the ugly. Things you need to keep in mind, whether you've already tested or you're thinking about testing. Unexpected discoveries, and I know Jerry was sharing how he had one of those. Um, those are not as uncommon <laughs> as you might think. In, in, in fact, unexpected coveries when you, discoveries when you DNA test are, um, are, are pretty common. So what are the kinds of things you might discover that you didn't realize? Uh, that you're adopted, <laughs> that your donor conceived, or someone in your family was. In other words, you match with people that you have no idea who, who they are, and you don't match with the people that you know is your family. Um, you know, a lot of families aren't open with this information. So, or some other case of misattributed parentage. And that just means that what you 
believe to be true in, tr in terms of who someone's parents are isn't actually true. So like, who's your parent that raised you may not be your biological parent, all right? So that can come to light. Um, you may have unknown half-siblings or other relatives. So maybe one of your parents had children with an, another partner that you're unaware of. DNA testing can bring things like that to light. Um, sometimes it's a little more innocuous in that you just realize you have an error in your family tree or your family lore. You know, you were really invested in that family story about being related to that Revolutionary War hero and then you find out that wasn't true and that's kind of a downer. That can happen too, but you might find someone else that you are related to. And your heritage, you might find out that your heritage is different than expected. Now, again, we're taking our ethnicity estimates with a big grain of salt, but you still can find out things um, like this that may be accurate. So the example, one of our case studies, our young African-American gentleman who found out he's actually a quarter Jewish. And I have to tell you, he was thrilled because he was a huge Bernie Sanders supporter. So he was like, oh, I'm probably related to Bernie. <laughs> so it's not always an unpleasant surprise. It can be a happy, unexpected finding. Um, the other thing you need to be prepared for is there are a lot of people who are adopted who are, who are really you know, looking hard and searching for their family. And if you come up, even as distant as a third cousin, they might reach out to you. They might look for help. They might want you to try and share information about your family to help them figure out who their biological parents are. Now, there's no right or wrong answer on how to feel about this or what to do about this. This is a very individual call. You know, some people, if they're contacted by someone who's been adopted, you know, just will do anything to help. They would love to help. Other people don't want anything to do with it. You know what? Just gives me the heebie-jeebies. I don't even want to touch it. There's no right or wrong way to feel about this. I just want you to think about it. I just want you to be aware that these things happen, and they happen a little more frequently than you might think. <clears throat> All right, more fine print. Handling of your information, sort of privacy issues. Now, these companies all want our business, obviously, and they're getting it. And they don't want to annoy us. They don't want to mishandle our information. They are invested in protecting our information to keep our business. However, it's still possible um, they might be subject to court orders to access your information. Now, there's some laws in place that help us. There's a law called GINA, so that uh, employers and health insurance cannot use your genetic information to discriminate against you. So there are some protections, but there aren't protections for long-term health care insurance. There aren't protections for disability insurance. So again, things to just think about. Um, there have been some news stories lately about police using um, what people have sent in to get at their DNA. I think that's a little far-fetched because for those of you who have tested, no, I could send in my sample and say this is Elvis Presley. And I am not Elvis Presley, but you, know, you can stick any name on your DNA. There's no chain of custody. So I think that's a little bit far-fetched and I, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, a few companies are going to want to enroll you in research projects. You might have seen that. I think it's usually 23andMe and my, uh, Ancestry. Um, that can be great, but you should read the consent. There should be an informed consent form that goes along with that, and you might have to click on a link. But you want to know how they're going to use your information. You're going to want to know how they protect it. Is it de-identified? So take the time to know what you're getting into. That's what I'm really telling you. Again. People have different feelings about these things. It's a very individual, individual choice. Data breaches. Is it possible for these companies to get hacked? Yeah, it is. But hackers might be more apt to try and get your name and credit card number because there's more financial gain involved there than your DNA information. But it's, it's plausible they could get it. Um, so again, what's your comfort level with that? Do you feel like your company is taking adequate steps to keep you safe? read their terms of service and their privacy agreement. All that horrible legalese fine print, but just try to wade through it and get a sense and measure your own comfort level. Make sure you're okay with it. These companies are not regulated. So 23andMe, the health testing part, different animal, so I'm not talking about that, but the ancestry testing is really for entertainment. So there's not like there's government regulation checking out these things for you. You just sort of have a contractual relationship with the company. All right, 
Another thing you need to think about is your user settings. If you do test and you're on there, how much information do you want to share with the outside world? Do you want to allow them to run relative matching? That's where they show people who you're related to. Um, it used to be just automatic. I think now all the companies, if I'm not mistaken, you have to opt into that. Now I would say if you're testing, you want to do that because that's where all the fun is. But if all you want is your ethnicity estimate, you could opt not to participate. Are you going to label your results with your full name so people can find your Facebook page and learn all sorts of things about you? Or just your initials? Or are you going to uh, come up with some fake name or sort of be anonymous? There's no right answer. It's what you want to do, but think about it. How much information are you willing to share with matches? Do you want to put your family tree out there? You know, how, you know, what do you want to know about someone before you start giving them all sorts of personal information, like, you know, your mother's maiden name? Do you want to connect your tree information? Do you want to make it really easy so that anyone can quickly see your family tree? Um, you know, as someone who works doing this, I love it when people do that. It makes my job a lot easier, but are you comfortable with that? Just ask yourself these things. And finally, if, if you aren't comfortable and you have second thoughts, um, you can just kind of not, you can unparticipate even if you've already tested. You can contact the company and ask for them to delete your results. I'm not encouraging anyone to do this, don't get me wrong. But I just think it's important that we're all aware of these issues. Be informed, be an informed consumer. All right, putting it all together. Yes, be an informed consumer. Understand how your information is being used and any of the risks that you're taking. That's very important. Just be informed. Understand the limitations of these testing results. They're great, but they're not all equal, and particularly that ethnicity estimate has some pretty big limitations, as I think we've covered, and hopefully that you're taking that away. Embrace the power of the relative matches. You can do so much with those. We have only scratched the very surface, the very, very, very surface. Um, but you can get into this. You can start working on your own projects. There are webinars and books and all sorts of resources out there. If you want to dig deeper and really get into this, you can. Um, so definitely don't overlook those relative matches. You can just do so much with them. And you can connect with people, which is really, really fun. So come up with a question. Come up with a curiosity. Uh, as I think the kid book title, Choose Your Own Adventure. What do you want to learn about your family? What are you interested in? Write down your question, figure out your strategy, and dive in. So happy sleuthing. All right. So that's the end of my part. And I would love to take questions at this point. CTV, and we have this a second mic. So when Jennifer calls on you, I'll bring the mic over, and, and you get to talk into the mic, so everybody can hear you later on too. Or, or Jerry, if you just want to run around like Phil Donahue, handing the mic to people, because I'll say the gentleman in the back, and there are like three gentlemen in the back. <laughs> okay. All right, questions. I'm Excuse wondering. Me, sir. <laughs> okay. This is what we're gonna do. I'm wondering about the correct or established usage of great and grand with respect to aunt and uncles and niece and nephew. It is a raging controversy, oh. I tell you. I, um, I see professional genealogists arguing about that all the time, and people have very strong feelings. I use great, but there are people who feel very strongly that is incorrect, and you should use grand. I'm not sure I can give you a definitive answer on that, so I would just go with whatever you like. <laughs> In the situation of unexpected results, yes. Um, is there something in place to deal with an occasional individual that finds something out that absolutely undermines his identity, has emotional difficulties? In other words, that I find out that my great-great-grandfather was Jack the Ripper. Right. There, there's, you know, in terms of resources like support for dealing with that kind of information, is that what you mean? There is not, but I, um, that, that's a very important question and that's very true. When I'm working with people who were adopted and wanting to find their parents, um, part of our initial discussion is um, 
what if you find out something you know that's not maybe the fantasy um, what if someone is in prison or wasn't a great person or doesn't want anything to do with you and we, we talk about the importance of having resources for support in place counseling um, supportive partner whatever so that that is something um, that people need to avail themselves of but unfortunately there's nothing already in place for that so it would it would be the onus would be on the person themselves to to seek those resources to help them sort of process the discovery and these are sometimes really heavy things that you discover so so i highly recommend that that people again like think about this how are you going to handle it and and where would you turn if you need support yes could you just talk a little bit about the health testing Sure, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, disclaimer, not a doctor. I do have a background in epidemiology though, so I'm very familiar with um, sort of the risk language that 23andMe uses. Um, is there anything specific about that? Um, is, it just one, is it just one company that does that? And, and well, how do people use that information that they receive? Okay, at the moment, of the four testing companies that we've been talking about today, 23andMe is the only one that offers that information. Now the FDA has decided that um, when testing kits are used in that way, they qualify as a medical device. You all may have remembered it was in the news that 23andMe got shut down for a while because they weren't necessarily following FDA standards and they were sort of doing it as um, a recreational test, but the FDA said, no, actually this is falls under our purview, so you have, your lab has to be up to our standards and we have to approve everything that you do. Um, there are some rumors that Ancestry might be moving in that direction, but I don't know if that's true. Um, the other thing some people do is you can, and I didn't really get into this, but you can um, download your raw data for most of the testing companies, and there are some what we call third-party sites where you could then, so I could go to Ancestry and say, download my raw data, and then I could go to this website called Prometheus and upload my raw data, and they're gonna give me some health estimates. And what those look like is, it's, it's really about risk. There's a baseline risk for every disease, but then if you have certain genes, you may have an increased risk or maybe a lessened risk. So what they're trying to do is give you information about your relative risk. Um, what I find is that unless people are really comfortable with the concept of, of risk and understanding how that works, this can be extremely disconcerting information and it's really open to misinterpretation. So my research at the medical school is primarily with multiple sclerosis. And in sort of, I don't know if this is irony or coincidence or what, I tested with 23andMe. I did the medical test. I have really good genes except for a couple. I'm at like the highest risk you can possibly have for MS. How funny is that? I'm not worried about it. <laughs> because even though I might have five times the risk as someone who doesn't have the gene, the risk is teeny tiny. Five times teeny tiny is tiny. <laughs> so the odds are still way more in my favor. I'm not gonna get MS, all right? Does that mean that when I sit too long and my leg falls asleep, I don't like to go, oh my God, here it is. <laughs> I do, and I know better. So. <laughs> You know, you, you, if you're really concerned about um, having increased risk for something, talk to your doctor. You can get targeted tests and have a genetic counselor explain it to you in an understandable way. I tell people, you know, it's not worth, it's not worth kind of the constant anxiety. I mean, you all know yourselves well. Some people, maybe they can handle it, um, but it's, it's easy to get caught up to it and then overanalyze everything you feel. So, buyer beware. Best option, talk to your doctor, would be my advice. And I would say particularly avoid those third-party sites. I know of two women personally who uploaded their raw data to that Prometheus and got the message back that they carried the BRCA gene for breast cancer, and then they got a message saying, oops, sorry, that was a mistake. But they can't let it go. They're like, well, which, which is it, a mistake or not? And it's really affected them in a negative way. We don't need that, we don't need that. So that's my opinion. I'm curious about, um, you mentioned uh, siblings earlier, uh, male and female. Yes. Are females more likely to uh, have DNA in common and then brother and sister or brothers more likely? Because you mentioned something about the 
females don't get, uh, women don't get certain. The, the Y DNA. Yeah. 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 So, so um, what brothers, hold on, I have to think of a picture in my mind. What brothers would have is, so their dad's going to have an X and Y chromosome, and for them to have come out to be boys, they're both going to have their dad's Y chromosome. So what brothers are going to have is um, an identical Y chromosome. Um, that, and sisters, of course, since they're two X's, they don't. But what sisters would have would be um, you know, some mishmash of mom's two X chromosomes, and then they're going to have dad's. Dad only has one X to offer, and he has to offer the whole deal. So sisters would have a common X chromosome from dad. So really, net, I wouldn't expect that brothers would share more than sisters. Does that make sense? Kind yeah, of? well, I have <laughs> six sisters and no brothers. So oh, okay. If they were to be tested, would they be more likely to come up with the same um, similar results? More similar than you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We've got one lady back there. And, uh, sorry. I'll get you next. Uh, I'm not much of a consumer, and I have submitted swabs for DNA testing of two family members. Um, what I was interested in knowing was whether my father was the father of this other family member. It okay. had acquired quite a lot of interest throughout my childhood and adulthood. Okay. And the myth was laid to rest. Now, it's too long ago, it may be in my computer, but probably not, um, to know what company I sent that to. Okay. But it cost a heck of a lot more <laughs> I, I bet it did. <laughs> than what we're talking about. Yes, yes. And, um, and it had a purity in the results. Namely, they said that the likelihood of my father's being the father of the other DNA sent in was zero. It did not say anything else like um, maybe they're related, right, in some yeah. way. Yeah. It just simply said zero. Okay. If that were the case and they were related in some other way, would the company have told me? I, I'm not completely sure I'm following your question. Okay. If they were related in some other way, not as siblings, but like as cousins? Not as father and daughter, but okay. as uh, um, well, not, right. know, not knowing the company, uh, not knowing the company, uh, it's a little hard for me to say. And, yes. and was this was this more like a paternity test, or was it? It was these? a paternity test. Okay, yeah. So those are a little bit different. So they um, off so, topic. So yeah, no, but I appreciate I appreciate the question. I mean, if there had been you know some commonality in shared DNA. Um, they still might have said 0% if it didn't reach the threshold for paternity, if they were testing specifically for paternity. Yes. Um, I'm not sure if they would have, if it would have changed the percentage, like there's a 2% chance, or I don't know enough about paternity testing to give you a really good answer, okay. I'm sorry. Thank but, you for um, addressing it though. Yeah. But it, it seemed like the standard for the test was more reliable um, than some of these sort of entertainment testings that are going on. I've never thought of it that way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, paternity testing would be, you know, often involve legal matters, so for sure they, they, they might, for example, have some oversight for those labs. Yes. Thank you. Yes, sorry, I can't give you a better answer. This, this young lady in the front has been waiting for so long. Uh, I, my question was, my mom and I sent in the Ancestry a couple weeks ago, so we're just the way it came at such an awesome time. But, so thank you. Um, but I was going through the thing. I said, do you want to participate in a study? I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. But then I thought, oh, if I'm participating, then everyone I write down that's linked to me, are they participating? And I in in felt, research? Yeah, I almost felt like, would that be a betrayal of their uh, comp? Like, I was overthinking it maybe, but right, so I would so, do it. Um, I'm not sure exactly what Ancestry is doing right now. Like, I, I know, you know, I tested quite some time ago, and I know I was asked the same thing. Um, but they're probably just going to take your de-identified results, um, and they may, they may sell them. <laughs> did, did it say anything about selling them in there? Uh, they probably read all the fine print. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, because it is, if they have, you know, think how many millions of people have tested, 
and they can de-identify the results, but it's still... They said I, they would do that, but... I can tell you, as a researcher, I have to fight tooth and nail to get 20 people to DNA test for me. So to be able to have a pool of millions of people and maybe assess the frequency of certain markers for whatever, uh, you know, that could be a very valuable asset, and that may be what they're doing. So it's not necessarily, since it's de-identified, it's not really going to out anyone else in your family, because they don't really know who it goes with. They're really going to be more interested, I think, in, back to like your tree that you're making and putting on the No, but, but I mean, just your regular participation in Ancestry absolutely does that. Like, you are, you are out of <laughs> So, unexpected discoveries, and I forgot to say this. You might say, yeah, I'm really uncomfortable. I don't really want to know about unexpected discoveries. But all it takes is your third cousin being like, woohoo, ancestry and testing to out those same unexpected discoveries, right? So it's kind of like, just because you decide not to test it doesn't mean it won't come out. And, and furthermore, paper research can find unexpected findings too. I forgot to say that. I mean, that's just kind of paper research, just even documentary records you can you can find unexpected things. So they happen one way or another. DNA just makes them really efficient <laughs> in terms of how they happen. But, but no, participating in the research is not going to compromise the identity of your relatives. Okay. But um, you. participating in relative matches will. <laughs> back, back to paternity testing. <laughs> OK. Um, paternity te I'm a geneticist. Paternity oh, okay. testing can rule out a parent if you're lucky. For instance, if the accused father is blood type AB and the child is blood type O, then the father could not have been the parent because he would have had the A or the B gene. So when they say they've ruled it out Definitely. for some other whatever reason, they have really ruled it out. On the other hand, you can never prove that the guy is the father. Just that they could be. Is that right? right. I got yes. you. And is that but, usually what they do? Paternity testing is, used, is usually used legally to exclude, exclude. the father. Okay. I and mean, that's the okay. main reason for it. Okay. So maybe you two should talk. <laughs> <laughs> they, could, they could, for some reason, say that definitely not for the guy having been the father. And it, I assume they look at genes beyond just blood type. Yeah, some, yeah. some other. Some other some, okay. Okay. Some Thank you very much. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. genes, they had a pot in the Wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, we got some of our this side. I have two questions. Okay. Um, one of them is, the bigger a database is, the more accurate the information becomes. Is that correct? Um, what kind of information? So, the, um, for example, the ethnicity estimates, as more and more people test, will become more refined, certainly. Um, in terms of relative matching, then um, they're more people you might possibly match with. I feel like I'm going, no, I'm still here. It might answer, so maybe you can just give me a little bit more what well, you think. thinking. I'm thinking about the future, and those of us who tested for kind of scientific curiosity, yeah. and you know, I'm thinking, is there a way that someday they're all gonna have standardized panels, and all the data collected from the different places are gonna be combined in one place? I think those types of um, possibilities are out there. It's a little bit hard hard to know where things are going to go. It's pretty amazing. You know, there are people who are working on testing your um, DNA and then being able to reconstruct your face. I'm going in and out. I'm sorry. Um, being able to reconstruct your face based on that, like using that in crime, for example. So I think there are all sorts of possibilities in the future, but it's a little bit hard to predict with certainty. But yes, the more data they have, the more precise, whenever they're estimating anything statistically, the more precise it's going to be. And the second question is, how did you get the dog to spit in the tube? <laughs> <laughs> it's a swab. You only just have to, he can't have eaten for half an hour, and you just got to rub the swab. It's a cheek swab test, so. It was really fun. I learned a lot about my dog. I understand it much better now, so I highly recommend it. Amazon. Are there any unexpected results? Yes, he was supposed to be purebred lab, and he's actually mostly great Pyrenees. He's happy, which explains why he's huge. He's only a quarter lab. He looks like a lab. I was going to bring his picture, but I didn't have it. You mentioned the, the use of raw data for medical reasons. Would there be any other 
reason to use raw data? That you might want, yes. So there are a lot of so-called third-party tools that let you do all sorts of fun analyses and really complicated analyses like at chrom you know, comparing on a chromosome by chromosome basis with matches and things like that. Um, and to take advantage of those, generally you do have to download your raw data um, from your testing company and then upload it. So there's, there's um, GEDCOM, GEDmatch, there are all sorts of third-party sites, which are, are more for family history reasons, reasons and finding how you're related to someone um, than that health site I told you about. Um, it was really beyond the scope of this. This is really getting down into the weeds. But yes, there are reasons why your raw data could be useful for you at these third-party sites. Jennifer, is, um, I came across a site called DNA Painter. Yes. Does that, do you need to then download or can we just enter? I, you know, I honestly don't know, Jerry. I have not used it. Yeah, um, yeah. I've only heard about that one recently, so I'm not sure if you have to have raw data go to that one. Anyone else? Yes. So I, I understand the, D, the ethnic estimate. Okay. And they show you how many percentages. But right. on Ancestry below this, it says see all 150 regions. Mm -hmm. And when I start looking at the numbers, they're not a percentage. They they add up to 139. Huh. Now typically when, I, I'm not sure I'm thinking about the same thing. Um, usually they'll show you the ones where you did have something and then if you do the drop down menu, it gives you their entire list of categories, but but the ones you aren't, haven't seen are either what they call trace reason, re regions or else once you're a zero add. Um, so I'm not quite sure, that sounds a little, Yes. Maybe I'll have to get on a... <coughs> I, I, I have often seen where it doesn't add up to 100, because sometimes there are regions they just can't call, so they don't. But to right. go this over 100... Is, yeah, that's, that's strange, and I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure what that's about. Okay. Try again on a different day and see if it's still doing <laughs> it. I should have all work and ask the question at Ancestry. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> sure, sorry, I don't have a better answer for you. Well, I was wondering, uh, it's getting kind of close to uh, closing time. Closing time, yes. And I was wondering maybe um, what you could, if people are interested, can come up and talk to you individually for Absolutely. A, okay. Yes. Very yes. wonderful. Um, I, if you want to just quickly peruse on your way out, I did bring some books from my collection. If you want to just take a look and, and test if you haven't seen what they look like. Um, and, and my resources, like my charts, and also cards. I know we're kind of running out of time, so if anyone has questions that they weren't comfortable asking in front of everybody or whatever, and they want to shoot me an email or give me a call, please feel free to do that, and I'll be happy to answer And we do have the handouts. Okay. And we only made 50 copies, so if you come with a couple, just take one, please. And maybe the PDF might be available somewhere. I, I'd be happy to um, send the... PDF yeah, to Star, her, so, okay. and then she could distribute. Or she had, you have the PDF. So Star, Star, feel free to share the PDF. Okay. Thank you all so much. Have a great weekend. Okay.